In September 2019, for our spring lecture series, Roof Logic had the opportunity to bring world-renowned Dr. Joe Steebrook from Building Science Corporation to New Zealand. Hundreds of people throughout the country had the opportunity to come and listen to Joe in person, and we've had great feedback from those who attended. The most common feedback we received? We really enjoyed listening to what Joe had to say. So much of it was of value to our industry here in New Zealand, but it was a lot to take in all at once. So we've put together a video that covers the most important material that Joe had to share with us. And having had the chance to listen to the video again, we agree it's even better second time around. With a unique depth of knowledge and experience and searing logic, Joe challenges us to take a principled approach to building and closure design and to create beautiful buildings that also set a new standard for durability and energy efficiency. At Roof Logic, we focus on providing the commercial construction industry with a range of high performance building enclosure solutions for roofs and walls, which incorporate the building science principles articulated by Dr. Joe Steebrook. We trust you'll enjoy the video. I thought, I thought I'd start off with defining a building. And I know that that sounds like, what, what a, really this guy's gonna talk about defining a building? I mean, surely that's a kind of a dumb place to start. And um, actually not, because we sometimes miss the point. Um, a building is a different thing to different people, different organizations, different groups, different professions. And I wanna tell you what a building is from a building science or a building physics perspective. From a building science or a building physics perspective, a building is an environmental separator. Its function is to keep the outside out and the inside in. Pretty clear? Pretty clear. Well, well why? Well, sometimes the outside sucks. You don't want the outside inside because it's bad. Yeah, keep that out. Yeah, woo. Sometimes the inside sucks and you don't want the inside in the thing that separates the inside from the outside. Right? Pretty simple. Here's where it gets to be interesting. What are the odds that that thing that separates the inside from the outside is done perfectly? <laughs> yeah, right. You know, slim and none. And slim is just left out. All right, so it's pretty clear that the inside is gonna get into the thing that separates the inside from the outside and we have to decide whether to kick it back or let it through. Sometimes the outside is gonna get into the thing that separates the inside from the outside, and we have to decide whether to kick it back or let it through. Now, how much we kick back or let through in each direction depends on four things. And so I'm gonna talk about what those four things are. And of the four, Two are insanely obvious. You're gonna like, you know, come on, you know, of course we knew that. The third, you're gonna say, ah, oh, okay. And it's not kind of a easy thing to get around when I get to the third. It's gonna irritate people. And then the fourth pisses people off because the location of the building establishes the external environmental load. Make sense? There's a big difference between Queenstown and Auckland. Before you design and build your building, you should probably know whether it's gonna be built in Queenstown or Auckland. What do you think? Nodding here would give me a sense that I'm connecting with you and that the beer wasn't as effective as it might have been. All right, so that makes sense. The second, again, should be straightforward, obvious, and that is what's going on inside the building? Is it a warehouse? Is it a residential occupancy, commercial occupancy? Is it an indoor swimming pool connected to a data processing center, hospital, art gallery, museum? It's one of the new projects in town. So what's going on inside establishes the internal environmental load. So okay, of, of the four, two are, come on. Number one, external environmental load. Number two, internal environmental load. Number three. Okay, here's where it begins to get kind of wonky. What materials are used to comprise the environmental separation? Are we building out of thousand-year-old trees and rocks? 
Are we building out of was wood? Was wood once, it ain't wood no more. Engineered wood is an insult to both wood and engineers. Yeah, yeah. You're not gonna believe this. You know, the youngsters in the room, you have no idea. We used to go to these places called forests. Yeah. We used to cut things down called trees, cut them into boards, build things called boats out of them. We used to put them in the water and sail them around the freaking world. Try doing that with engineered wood or sheathing. You're gonna die, right? We used to have a wet applied interior finish, plaster and lath. Now we have drywall, which is basically paper. We're lining our buildings with paper. We're building paper buildings. Even the dumbest of the three little pigs didn't build his house out of paper. <laughs> what are the odds that we're gonna go back and build out a thousand year old trees and rocks? Not gonna happen. So we're gonna have to come to terms with the new materials. Well, the new materials can't be used the same way that the old materials are used, because they're new. See, because they're different, they have to be used differently because they're different. All of the stuff that we're building out of can't be used the way we used to build. You ponder that for a minute. All of the stuff that we're using can't be used the way we used to use stuff because it's not the same. I mean, this, you know, is an aha moment. Ah, ah. All right, number four, whoa. What have we done to the energy efficiency of our buildings? Has it got better or worse? Okay, this is not a trick question. I'm setting you up. <clears throat> I'm screwing with you, but not yet. This is part of the build-up to mess you up. So this is, you know, I'm setting this up. Yes, Joe, we're insanely more energy efficient, right? Yes. <clears throat> what are the odds that we're going to get more energy efficient? Huge. Absolutely. We're going to go insanely efficient. We're efficient now, but we're going to go insanely, woo-hoo, yay, efficient, woo. And I, I view that as good, okay? I, I'm not complaining about that. I'm an engineer. Engineers are born with a genetic defect. It's the efficiency gene. We can't help ourselves. But I'm an old engineer. And so I've learned stuff like the second law of thermodynamics, which was put to music by the second best guitarist of all time. You can't get your money for nothing and your chicks for free. Who was that? Mark Knopfler. Apparently I'm not allowed to, in, at the, or I teach at the University of Toronto, the snowflakes get all upset when I say you can't you know, get your money for nothing and your chicks for free. So I say there's no such thing as a free thermodynamic lunch. Apparently that's politically correct. It's okay for things to get wet if they dry. Wetting followed by drying is okay. Wetting that is not followed by drying is not okay. Everybody get it? Nodding here would Aha, I got it. Drying involves an exchange of energy. You can't dry if there isn't an exchange of energy. So what have we done to the exchange of energy? We've reduced it, which means the drying potential of our buildings has gone down. So buildings are staying wetter longer because they're more energy efficient. And that irritates everybody who doesn't know physics. That would be journalists and art graduates. We're going to save the planet. We're going to be energy efficient. Yeah, and it's easy to be energy efficient. It's cheaper to be energy efficient. Everybody can freaking do it. The answer is no. It's not easy. It's not cheap. Do we need to do it? Well, yeah. But I'm tired of dealing with children without adult supervision. 
You just can't be energy efficient because you've changed the energy balance, which means that the building is going to stay wet longer if you don't intervene and keep it from getting wet in the first damn place. So if we've changed the drying potential, we have to change the wetting potential. How many people know about windows? You ever heard of windows? Okay. There are only two kinds of windows in the world. Windows that leak and windows that will leak. So what do we know about windows? They leak. Not all at once and not at the beginning. Only one out of 10 leak the day they're made. The problem is the manufacturers don't label them for us. They don't say that this is the one. So we, we have to assume what? That they're all gonna leak. And it gets worse, yeah. Windows are like people. As windows and people get old, we leak. <laughs> you youngsters have no freaking idea. <laughs> a five to 10 year period, the 10% leakage goes to 30 to 40% leakage. Back in the day, we didn't care because we called that incidental water. It leaked into a wall cavity that was made out of thousand-year-old trees and rocks without insulation, so what? It dried. Whoop-de-doo. Now, that incidental water is no longer incidental. It hangs around longer because we can't get it out or in because there isn't energy and the materials can't take it. Well, so what should we do? No windows. Well, that would be stupid. No insulation. Well, that would be stupid. Thousand-year-old trees and materials. That's not possible. So we have to change the way we install windows, right? So now we're lining the opening with a flashing system. So when the inevitable leakage happens, we direct the water to the outside. A leak is not a leak if the client never sees it. Repeat after me. A leak is not a leak if the client never sees it. Now we're pretty damn good with the windows, but we're not perfect. But we direct the water to the outside. So in the last 15 years, in other places, we've changed the way we install every window, every door, every curtain wall, every storefront, every punched opening is now drained to the outside because we can't tolerate incidental water because incidental water is no longer incidental. Whoa. You mean it's that easy? Well, yeah, if you know. How come we know? Well, we know in North America. Would you like to know why? We were stupid before you were. We're number one. So you should be not stupid. You're actually quite fortunate. You didn't insulate until recently. <laughs> so when did stupid begin to happen in New Zealand? Well, 2000, 2001. You had the weather tightness crisis, right? You all brain blamed radiata pine, Frankenwood. Give me a break. It's the insulation. But it was easy to blame wood than stupid building practice, wasn't it? Yeah, suck it up. Yeah, that was the problem. You're still, whoa, it's not our fault. Well, yeah, it was. Just take the insulation out. No, change the way you flash and do your water management. We have a motto. If you want to save cash, flash. Don't be a dope slope. Let's try to codify that in the code. What do you think? <laughs> Let me tell you everything you need to know about flashing. Good, bad. Good, bad. You're welcome. I'm done. <laughs> All right. So what's the challenge? Well, the challenge is to understand that buildings have changed, and they're going to continue to change. And they're going to get better if we're not dumb. And you have an opportunity here to do it right from learning from all of the people that did stupid stuff. So I'm going to tell you how to tell what was stupid and where to look for stupid stuff 
so that you don't do it here. Is that, that's where we're gonna go with this. So this is a, a map of North America. Um, and I wanna start there for a reason that'll make sense in a couple of minutes, but this is my big contribution to building science or building physics. This is my lifetime Grammy, you know, Emmy gold record. It's a map of hydrothermal regions. It's been adopted by, you know, everybody. It basically describes the climate zones in the world based on vegetation. I figured out early in my career that the plant kingdom is better at figuring out hydrothermal loads than engineers and architects and contractors. Plants are smarter than us. Don't laugh. Plants know temperature, relative humidity, rainfall, wind, solar radiation. Um, what you need to know is New Zealand is in the light pink. New Zealand is in the light pink. So you shouldn't look to Canada for advice. Canada's filled with Canadians. What are you doing? You need to deal with Memphis. You know, Memphis makes more sense than Vancouver. Vancouver screwed up for reasons that aren't the same as here. So why would you listen to them? I'm speaking as a Canadian, now an American. I moved to America because Canada adopted the metric system. <laughs> this is also a map of, of rainfall. Um, this is referenced in all of the American and Canadian building codes. I was one of the first to point out that where it rains more, you need more rain control. <laughs> okay, let me give it to you again so you understand, all right, because this was a 20-year fight. Where it rains more, you need more rain control. Okay, what's unusual about this map is there are places where it doesn't rain very much. New Zealand is unique. You are the only industrialized country in the world that gets an insane amount of rain everywhere. You have more rain than any other country on the planet that is industrialized. More rain. So you would expect that you should be smarter at it than everybody else because you have more of it. But you aren't. And the reason you aren't is you didn't have to be because you didn't have insulation. You could be stupid until you couldn't be stupid. When you added insulation, you had to become insanely good, anally fastidious with rain because you changed the energy balance. And you're just coming to terms with that. And what are the odds that you're gonna to have to be even more energy efficient? And what are the odds that the rain is going to stop? Not going to happen, all right? So my hydrothermal map and the rainfall map was incorporated in the building codes. And the building codes in North America tell you that you need to build differently based on the hydrothermal loads and the internal loads. In other words, point one and point two are now recognized because they're the environmental stressors from both the inside and the outside. Make sense? Okay, this is a map of the world. This, yeah, yeah, this is the world. And it shows the hydrothermal regions of the world. And I wanna point out that New Zealand is right here. See, green, green. This part of North America is analogous to New Zealand. Australia, bad. New Zealand, good. This is the part of North America where you should learn your lessons. Not over here, not over here. New York, ah, you go there for dinner and drinks. Not how to build a wall. Even though you're all in the green in the big map, there are big differences between Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and Queenstown. 
you're not as small as you think you are, which is why you're really phenomenally interesting. So there's enough going on here that you need to know a lot more than people think you need to know because you're very interestingly different. This is a map of rainfall. This is insane. Over here, I learned about how much rain was happening from a little old man walking with a staff to a big wooden boat with animals following him two by two. <laughs> so Auckland is Memphis. It's not Vancouver. Everybody with me on this? You should look at places that are similar to your places to see what has happened. Second law of thermodynamics. Nothing is more exciting to an old engineer than coming to a bunch of normal people and talking about the second law. That's the one that's of most importance to us and uh, we don't teach it to engineers correctly because we don't want them to be useful to society. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate it to make it useful. And you realize that if you now know this, you're, it's going to be tough to, to live because you're going to be part of a very small group of people who know stuff, not a large group. So here it goes. Here's what the second law means. Heat flow is from warm to cold. Why? Because. That's it. There's no explanation for it. See, we call something a law when we have no explanation for it. We can't derive this from first principles, the fundamental forces, but we know it to be true, not because we know it to be true, but because nobody has proven that it's not true. You see, you can never prove science. You can only disprove it. So the second law hasn't been disproven. And we don't have first principles to explain it. We just, it is. Your flow is from warm to cold. Why? Because, yeah, it's because. Okay, in the winter time, it's pretty common that the inside of your house or building is warmer than the outside. Yeah, really. So what direction is the moisture flow? From the inside out. Summertime, the inside is typically cooler inside than outside. So the moisture flow is from the outside in. <laughs> in Canada, Norway, and Sweden, there are only two seasons, this winter and last winter. So the moisture flow is always from the inside out. So where do you put a vapor barrier? On the inside. In Miami, there are only two seasons, hot and wet and hotter and wetter. So the moisture flow is always from the outside to the inside. So where do you put your vapor barrier? On the outside. What happens when you have seasons? Do you have summer? You have winter? You have spring? You have fall? What are you, batshit crazy putting a vapor barrier anywhere in that wall? Your wall goes both ways. You're diverse. Oh, how come the Canadians know so much? Well, they know a great deal about winter because it sucks in Canada. It's a hostile climate. We had to get really good at the winter because it was miserable and disgusting and hostile and we got good at it better than anybody else in the world from the cold side. So all of the Canadian information exhibits cold climate chauvinism. Who knows more about air conditioning than anybody alive? Well, the people in Florida. Well, because what do they do? It's hot and humid and all they freaking do is air condition. So they got really, really good at it. Who do you not ask about air conditioning? Well, the Germans. You got Hartwig smiling at me. 
Germans don't do air conditioning. Air conditioning is for weak people. It can be tough. That's the French need it, but we don't. We're German. Arr. So you have heating and cooling, and you have a lot of humidity, and you have a lot of rain. So you need to look at Memphis. All right, why is your flow is from more to less? You could do this experiment at home. You could take something wet and touch something dry. Son of a bitch, dry thing becomes wet. Who knew? <laughs> Who freaking knew? Wow. Air flows from a higher pressure to a lower pressure and gravity acts down. Man, if only we taught architects, contractors, and engineers this, life would be good. Now, of all of these mechanisms, the one that we're most concerned about is moisture, and there are two rules, warm to cold and more to less. Most of the time, they act in the same direction. Warm to cold and more to less, 15, 16, 17 times out of 20, I'm pulling that number out of my butt, they act in the same direction. When they act in opposite directions, more to less wins. So we use warm to cold as a surrogate for more to less. Why is that important? Most normal people can look at a wall or a roof or a foundation and say, this part is going to be cold and this part is going to be warm and most of the time the water ends up on the cold spot. Most normal people can go into a building and say this part of the building is warm, this part of the building is cold, and you know that the moisture is going to end up in the cold part of the building. It's very difficult intuitively to sense vapor pressure differences. Most people can't go into a space and say the vapor pressure here is different than here. And those that can do that also see dead people. <laughs> so most of the time, the bad stuff happens on the cold spot. So what you need to do is keep the moisture from getting to the cold spot or make the cold spot warm. Okay, this is an aha thing. You either keep the stuff from getting to the cold spot or you make the cold spot warm. And what we're finding, it's easier to make the cold spot warm than to keep the moisture from getting to the cold spot. Ah, whoa, you're kidding, yeah. Now, if you explain it the way that I just did, normal people would understand. That's why we can't let that stand. There's no way we would teach people this, because they would get it. So we have to make it more complicated. See, it's a thermal gradient in thermal diffusion and a concentration gradient in molecular diffusion. Whoa! Man, that sounds like freaking smart. You read that in a 25-page in a report in the opening paragraph. My God, that's going to cost a lot of money. Exactly. Freaking exactly. But, you know, smart people can actually now understand thermal diffusion and molecular diffusion, so that can't stand. So we call it vapor diffusion. See, it sounds important, but nobody gets it now. Yes! That's important for consultants. Yes! And we've said that it moves according to the thermodynamic potential. Thermodynamic. That means most of the time it ends up on the cold spot. But thermodynamic potential sounds cooler than most of the time it ends up on the cold spot. And here's a map of the thermodynamic potential. Ah! The psychopathic chart! Look at this! Curved lines, bent lines, 15 frickin' scales. Oh, oh my god, you go brain dead, batshit crazy. Luke, turn off the guidance system. Go with the force. The water ends up on the cold spot. That's what the freaking map says. Arrhenius <sighs> equation. Yeah, we're not done with the physics. You know, second law, <laughs> that's nothing. Arrhenius equation, 
Awesome. Third most famous equation in all of physics. What's the first? What's the second? Clearly you've been educated. The first is Newton. The second is Einstein. The third is Arrhenius. Arrhenius won the Nobel Prize in Physics, 1901, 1902. That was a huge scandal because he was a chemist. Nothing pisses off the physics community than having a chemist come in and kick physics ass. So here's the, uh, here's the uh, Arrhenius equation, and it just, it's, it's, it's breathtaking. It governs the damage functions, which are water, heat, and ultraviolet light. These damage functions are all exponential, meaning things get bad really quickly. All right? Every 10 degree Celsius change reduces the half-life of a material. That's how unbelievably dramatic it is. Wow, that's why it's whoosh, not rrr. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh bad, okay? But they're not additive. They're multiplicative. The effect of water over here, the effect of heat over here, when they're acting at the same time, they're not additive, they're multiplicative. So they're exponential and synergistic. Yeah, yeah. What part of your building sees all three of them happening the worstest, the mostest, at the same timest? The roof. Roof where the building touches the sky is the greatest environmental load. Apparently now you're getting why a roofing company hired me. <laughs> so. Got a black membrane roof, middle of the summer, two o'clock in the afternoon. Temperature is 180 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that, 85 degrees Celsius? Brown there? I replace that black membrane with a white membrane. It's running at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what, about 50 degrees? Celsius, which roof membrane is going to last longer? The black one or the white one? White one. But which roof assembly is going to last longer? The black one. Because its drying potential is higher. When we change the color of the roofs from black to white, we had moisture problems. So we had to introduce air barriers and air control layers underneath them. So we had to completely change the way we built our roof systems because we changed the color. I presented this a couple of years in St. Louis and I titled my talk, Black Roofs Matter. <laughs> All right, so which is more important to a manufacturer, the material characteristic or the assembly characteristic? Come on, you know this. Manufacturer cares more about their material than the assembly, doesn't it? But if you're an architect or a contractor, engineer, builder, or homeowner, you should be more interested in the assembly performance than the material performance because sometimes you have to comprise them, compromise the material performance in order to improve the building performance. This is an aha moment, okay? Assemblies trump materials. You figured out how to make the building not burn and not fall down. So you've handled the structure, you've handled the fire. What does a building now need? It needs a water control layer, an air control layer, a vapor control layer, and a thermal control layer in that order of importance. Water control layer is way more important than the air control layer. I've been doing this for a half century, and I've never gotten a call at three in the morning saying, my building is leaking air. Now, water, way more important than air. In uh, America, much to my disappointment and chagrin and humor, we have a group called ABBA the Air Barrier Association of America. We should have had a WABA, 
before we had an ABBA. And if you really look at things, you see America's in love with air barriers. And I'm like, really? Stop that. If you really look at things, the air barriers are really water control layers that have an air control function added to them. So the water control characteristics of your air barrier are more important than the air control characteristics of your air barrier. Let me repeat this to you. The water control characteristics of your air barrier are more important than the air control characteristics of your air barrier, especially in a place that's in paradise that has a, an enormous amount of rain that's now having highly insulated assemblies. I mean, it's, it's obvious, except we're not doing it. Okay, that's the message. Um, the vapor control layer, whoosh, not anywhere near as important as the air control layer. In fact, you're better off not having a vapor control layer than having one in the wrong place. Let me repeat this. You're better off not having one than having one in the wrong place. Now, the only place most people can agree is where the building touches the ground. Because most of the time, most of the places, the ground is wet, and you want the building on top of it to be dry, and so you want to stop the moisture movement from going from the ground up. In your walls, things are going in both directions, right? Because you have seasons. Whoa, we got seasons, yay! Okay. Thermal control layer, the least important. But it's the only one that we can calculate and measure reasonably well. So if it's not important, we can calculate it and measure it. The building code obsesses over it. It's nuts! Stop with the stupid freaking calculations! Whatever you think the R value should be, just double it and shut up and move on and worry about the damn rain. You can imagine how popular that makes me with the energy geeks. All right, more. Water molecules are weird. When they exist individually, like H2O, we call it vapor. But liquid, ah, Mother Nature, evil woman with a wicked sense of humor. 75 to 150 of them clump together. So vapor is H2O, liquid is H150, O75. Yeah. Golf ball, basketball. Golf ball, basketball. I got a bucket filled with golf balls and basketballs and I jiggle it around and I throw it on a grid and the grid has got holes in it big enough to pass the golf balls so it's small enough to catch the basketballs. That would be something that would be vapor permeable but waterproof. <coughs> Molecular diffusion is a very slow process. So they tend to go from warm to cold and more to less. Very, very slow. But let's say I have a cubic meter of air. Cubic meter. And I got a couple of trillion water molecules in it. I go, ah, I carried the cubic meter. I'm carrying a shitload of water molecules with that air. And it's a metric term. Texas. So air carries way more water vapor in the molecular form than molecular diffusion. So if you stop airflow with an air barrier, it's really a vapor barrier because you've stopped the air from carrying the water molecules. The vapor permeability and permeance is irrelevant to the function of stopping the air. Okay, let me give you an example. So if I've got a sheet of drywall, and I'm in Queenstown, which has a winter, and over the five months of the winter, the moisture is going from the inside out, and I paint it with latex paint, I get about a third of a liter of water over the season. I then cut a small hole the size of an electrical outlet, and because of the pressure difference between the heated inside and the cold outside, I'm going to get 30 liters of water. That's 100 to 1. 
I get way, way, way more with air than I do with molecular diffusion. So what should I be preoccupied with? Air. Wow, yeah. Now we got to figure out what the vapor transmission is of these materials. No, you don't. I mean, it's great to argue about in, in a bar, maybe in court. But if you get rid of the air movement, you're not going to end up in a court. You'll end up in a bar celebrating the fact that you're not in court. Let's, uh, let's go to Auckland in the summer. Outside is hot and humid. The inside is cold. The moisture is going from the outside in. Believe it or not, I get way more moisture from the outside in by diffusion in the summertime in Auckland than I get in the wintertime with diffusion from the inside out in Queenstown. But the airflow dominates as well. So wherever you are in New Zealand, the airflow is more important than the molecular diffusion. And repeat this, wherever you are in New Zealand, the airflow is more important than the molecular diffusion. Have I mentioned to you that anywhere in New Zealand, the airflow is more important than the molecular diffusion? I think you should. But it's sophisticated to do a permeance test. You have to hire a lab. People in white coats go around running around. Yeah, you get a report that nobody understands. That's the ticket. Yeah. So here's the perfect wall. I'm famous for the perfect wall. So I've been credited with the perfect wall even though I didn't come up with it, but I've told everybody about it because I added color and I added a brand name to it so that people are now beginning to say, whoa, if I build this this way, I don't have to do a calculation anywhere in the world. That's why it would be perfect. When I teach undergraduates at the university and now graduates, um, things have changed in almost 40 years since I went through. Um, back in the day, we were allowed to fail stupid people. Now we're, we're not allowed to fail stupid people. So I have to, I have to pass them. So I tell them, you're, you're stupid. There's no hope for you. I have to pass you. But here's the deal. For the rest of your career, just use that wall, because it works everywhere. You don't have to know geography, arithmetic, math. So let's take it to Queenstown um, and build it around an indoor swimming pool, hospital, art gallery, museum, right? A typical, normal, non-stressful interior climate load. And so the moisture is going to want to go whoosh zzz, from the inside out. You actually can't hear it. I'm just doing that to try to get you interested. So it blows through the structure, and you don't care how it gets there, whether it's diffusion or airflow, and it hits the black line, and what happens? Nothing. Nothing, because all, all of the insulation is on the outside, so I don't have a drop in temperature, so I don't have condensation, I don't have a change in phase. Yay! Nothing happens! Woo! Oh, hey. What are the odds that those lift operators and bartenders in Queenstown are going to get it built right? They're going to have flaws because they can't help themselves. Probably most of them are from Australia. So the stuff is going to get into the blue. But it's going to get out of the blue into the airspace and be connected to the outside because the cladding system is back ventilated and drained. So it fails in a fail-safe manner. Yeah, whoa, you could do stupid stuff and it works. I'm not encouraging you to do stupid stuff, but you could be stupid. Don't be stupid, but you could be. Let's take it to Auckland. Huh? Huh? And so it's going to be hot and humid out here, cold in here. The moisture is going to go. From the outside in, it's going to blow through this, blow through this, blow through this, hit the black line, and what happens? You know, it condenses, changes its phase. Oh my God, I've got water on the outside of the water control layer. Okay, let me give this to you again. Oh my God, 
I've got water on the outside of my water control layer, which is on the outside of my building. Well, that would be good, wouldn't it? Because it's on the outside. Yeah. Okay. What are the odds that all of those sailors in Auckland are going to get it right? Yeah, too busy worrying about America's Cup. So there are going to be flaws. So some of the stuff is going to end up in here, and we don't care as long as it gets from here into here. If it gets into here, I can take the air that has the moisture in it to a cold surface and change its face from a vapor to liquid to get it out of the damn building. Yeah! That's how it's done. So what must I never have on the inside of my wall in Auckland? A vapor barrier. Can't have vinyl wallpaper. Can't have epoxy paint. Can't have Alcott or oil paints. I can only have latex paints. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The wall will dry in. Woo hoo! If I lay it down, I get the perfect roof. If I lay it the other way, I've got the perfect slab. This is another aha moment. The physics of walls, roofs, and foundations are the same. Yeah. This is the perfect slab. So I'm going to have the perfect section, perfect wall, perfect foundation. Now comes an aha moment. I have to connect them to one another. And this is the magic of building science, building physics. I have to connect the water control of the roof to the water control of the wall to the water control of the foundation. The air control of the roof to the air control of the wall to the air control of the foundation. The vapor to the vapor to the vapor, the thermal to the thermal to the thermal, and I'm done. Well, it can't be that easy. Yes, it is. I teach youngsters design reviews, and I tell them, take a colored pen, take a freaking pen, and trace the water control around the details in the drawing set. And wherever you have to leave, your pen leaves the paper, you've identified a discontinuity. And take a different colored pen for the air control, and then another for the vapor, and another from the thermal. And that's all it takes. And we're not doing it. We have to. We have no choice but we're not doing it. You need to do it. We need to do it. Now, most failures occur where roofs meet walls and at openings. What's the most famous opening in a wall? Window. It should be pretty straightforward. You need to connect the water control of the wall to the water control of the window, the air control of the wall to the air control of the window, the vapor to the vapor, thermal to the thermal, Put it in plumb level and square, and don't let the wind suck it out or blow it or push it in. And we're done. I've just summarized a 400-page ASTM AMA document on windows and curtain walls and skylights. The problem is, is that the manufacturers don't tell us what part of the window serves what function. And even if they told you, don't believe them, because marketing doesn't know how their product works. Marketing is institutionalized lying. Most of the window manufacturers have forgotten how windows work to begin with, because the old people that knew stuff have retired or died. They don't have institutional memory. It's unbelievable. I don't trust them anyway. So we make the connection on the back side of the window in every application. So when it inevitably leaks, we direct the water to the outside. That is the foolproof way to do windows and doors and punched openings everywhere in the world. Three configurations of the perfect wall, and then I'm going to go and drink because I earned it. I don't think you have, but I have. The first is, I call it the institutional wall, um, the 500-year wall for three reasons. Number one, it represents 500 years of evolution. Number two, it lasts 500 years. Number three, it'll take your clients 500 years to pay for. So we build it out of rocks, because rocks don't burn. We cover it with sheet rock on the inside, because rocks don't burn. We put more rocks on the outside, because rocks don't burn. We insulate it with fluffy rocks, because rocks don't burn. So I did this presentation in New York, and. There's a guy in the front row. 
He says, uh, I'm a geologist. Coal is a rock. <sighs> so this is the wall that you save for special buildings, buildings that you hand down from one generation to the next because we don't know how to do it better. This is the best of the best of the best of the best that we know how to build. This, this is it. Um, not all walls need this. You could do this. You could replace the rocks with steel studs, gypsum sheathing, and then your water, air, vapor, and thermal control layer on the outside. All I've done is change the structure by getting rid of this and replacing it with steel studs. We call this the commercial wall. It's pretty damn impressive. It's not the perfect institutional wall, but man, it, it's, it's, it's awesome. Notice that there's no thermal insulation in the steel studs. Insulating a steel stud is a thermodynamic obscenity. If I fill it with fluffy insulation, I lose 75% of the thermal resistance because of the conductivity of the steel. You know how I know this? Yeah. Steel is 300 times more conductive than wood. You know why I know that? I've never seen wood wiring. <laughs> I've never seen a wood frying pan. Well, once. So the only way to make this work is I have to insulate the steel on the outside. I learned this as a child growing up in Canada. When it got cold, we learned to pull the sweaters over the outside of us. We didn't eat them and shove them into our ribs. You need to be a sweater wearer, not a sweater eater. Now, what is the reason to insulate steel studs? There's a good one. It's for acoustics. So you put fluffy stuff in the cavity for acoustical purposes, but you wear the sweater for thermal purposes. So there's a difference. If you just put the fluffy stuff in the cavity, you've handled the sound, but you haven't handled the energy. And you know, we've got to handle the energy, folks. I'm, you know, I, I, this presentation was not meant to not be energy efficient. This, we want energy. We just don't want to screw it up. Residentially, a wood timber frame, we can put fluffy stuff thermally in because we're only losing 10, 15% because of the thermal inefficiency of the framing, which is nothing. So I get to eat the sweater thermally and wear the sweater thermally. Notice where the air control is. It's all on the outside. That's freaking awesome. We learned how to do all of this by building test huts all over the world. Um, we built eight of them, ran them for 10 years. We did one in Auckland. Yeah. We modeled it on the old Greek test hut. <laughs> this told us how much of an airspace we needed in each particular climate zone. We didn't do a calculation because we didn't know how to do the calculation until we knew how to do the calculation. We knew how to do the calculation after we built the walls and beat the crap out of them for 12 years to figure stuff out. So now we know. So you don't have to do all the work, because we've already done all this work. What you should do is different work. You should be even better than us if you start out with not doing the dumb stuff that we did. So I'm challenging you. You live in paradise. You're just getting going. You're just getting going. Don't screw it up. You're not going to, because you're smart enough not to. Go to Memphis. Figure stuff out. Great barbecue, Elvis is still selling cars there. I'm pretty convinced of it. And bring that stuff back and do even better. And with that, I'm turning you over to our hosts. Thank you very much. <laughs>